As a little kid, I dreamt of doing it, and I guess I'm one of those guys lucky enough to live my dream. You never conquer the sea. It's always there, waiting for you. It's a tough race. People have died doing this. It's a tough, tough place to be. This race is the Everest of sailing. To win the Rolex Sydney Hobart for most sailors is a dream. But for one man, something was missing. My life is all about passion, and sailing has been my passion for a long, long time. And I woke up in the morning um, of Boxing Day 2004, and for the first time in my life, I turned to my wife and said, you know what, I don't want to go. And that really uh, made it clear for me that, uh, that was, uh, I needed a break. I've been doing this for a very long time. I've had a wonderful time. I've achieved more than I ever dreamt I would. And, um, and of course, what was beautiful was the fact that we did win the 2004 Rolex Sydney Hobart race. And I said to myself, well, that's not a bad way to, to, take a, to end the career if that's what it's going to be, or at least to take a break. I always loved the sailing, I just needed a break, I think, and I needed also to, f to do something that made me feel whole with my family. The next challenge was to turn 52 acres of abandoned farmland into a world-class equestrian facility and a base for daughter Dominique's bid to compete for Finland in the 2012 Olympic Games. But after five years, there was still one challenge that just wouldn't let go. I woke up one morning and I said, I've had enough of being bossed around by my daughters and uh, the only place where anybody respects me and, and that's what I tell them, that's uh, in this world of sailing. This race is the Everest of sailing. It is an incredible mountain to climb and it's always different. So you can do it as many times as you like and every time it's a totally different experience. I love every moment. <laughs> For some, the answers lay in the future. For others, they must look to their past. All children want to do is be the same. And when you're different for any reason, it's like, it's a disaster, you know, when your genes are one shade lighter than the next guy, or when everybody else in the world can read and you can't read, you feel the pain of that as a child. I went and had an exam, and the fellow said, no, you're not a slow learner, you're dyslexic. Um, I was a very cranky young man. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the odds of me getting end up in jail were pretty strong. I, mean, I think it was only good luck that, that I didn't go down that way. But David Pescud chose another path. He decided to share his love for the sea and sailing in a very unique way. And that's really what SWD, Sales with Disabilities, is about. You know, it's about. I'm a human being, that something doesn't function too well on or it doesn't work or I haven't got one, big deal, move on. Since their first Sydney Hobart in 1994, SWD has given thousands of disabled youngsters a taste for the ocean and finally they have a boat to win it. Over time I've lost my sight and now I've probably got about 2%. To me, sailing with sailors with disabilities isn't about sailing with disabled people, it's about sailing. We all work as a team together. To me, there's no difference. We're not here to prove that we can do the Hobart trip because we have disabilities. I do sailing because I love it. I love the challenge. It's very exciting when you're on the foredeck getting drenched with waves in front of around 
uh, working hard, it's, you feel very much alive and I definitely wouldn't give that up for anything. The Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race is to sailing what the Le Mans 24 hours is to motorsport. An unrelenting, tireless challenge that takes the fleet from Sydney down the New South Wales coast, across the fearsome Bass Strait before reaching the chill waters off Tasmania and then onto the finish of this epic race in Hobart. December the 26th, Sydney's Cruising Yacht Club of Australia and for the fleet, the long journey to Hobart starts here. No yachting event in the world captures the public's imagination more than this great race. This is Marine Rescue, Port Jackson, Marine Rescue, Port Jackson on 81. Can we have your registration number, please? Uh, okay, guys, it's now 12.50. 1300 is race start. Keep an eye out, listen out for the alarm. The gun barrel will, will be going off. The start of one of Australia's greatest sporting traditions is just moments away. Bit of a match race going on here. The most exciting part of the race, just before the start. And you've got these two super maxi monsters eyeballing each other. They're on final approach. Well, OK, they're away. A very good start right at the pin end there. Wait up, wait up, boys. And down goes the foot on Wild Oats. Clear start on both lines. No one over early, so that's great news for the 87 strong fleets. So first honours goes to Wild Oats 11. So at the moment, Wild Oats, a narrow lead over Investec Loyal. And Loyal immediately uh, has tacked. I got you, mate. Let's lock in. This is going back to the small boats. And here we are with uh, whatever, with David Pescued at the helm and his crew of disabled sailors. What a fantastic effort. Here's Yuzu and Luda Ingvale, currently in third place. And here's the one they have to catch. Wild Oats 11, full steam ahead. First out the heads again in 2010. Investec Loyal chasing hard. And these two are going to have a battle royale. Last year, it was Wild Oats' arch-rival Neville Crichton and his yacht Alfa Romeo who were first to Hobart. But this year, Australian billionaire Bob Oatley, owner of Wild Oats, is more determined than ever to return from Tasmania with the trophy. He may not sail in the race itself, but his commitment is legendary. Well, last year certainly hurt not winning uh, because it would have made it five in a row, so... Uh... It certainly hurt, and uh, it's something we don't want to happen again. That's why we've put such an effort into this year's preparation. Yeah, this is our sixth year to Hobart in this boat, and um, yeah, I feel more confident than I've ever felt with the boat. And I think it always comes down to preparation, and uh, if we had to put the effort in you know, last year as this year, which is easy to say, you know, I'm sure it could have been a different story, but yeah, you know, Salah and here we are, and let's hope we can do it this time. But for some, victory is not all about coming first. Powerboat racing is very dangerous. We were reaching speeds of 140 miles an hour on water. I had four lucky escapes, four backflips. It does take a toll on your body. We were living on the edge and you can only push the boundary so long. The buzz of sailing is, is definitely offshore. The unknown with nature, you never know what's around the corner with the wind and I just love it. It's like another adrenaline rush. The Rolex Sydney Hobart for me was something that I saw as a young fella watching TV and of course living in Hobart would watch the yachts coming up to Derwin every year. And I guess I'm one of those guys lucky enough to live my dream. A few days before the race start and Todd Leary, owner of one of Tasmania's largest plumbing firms, finishes his final preparations for this year's Rolex Sydney Hobart. Within a few minutes of last year's start, his boat was involved in a collision and his dream of sailing into Hobart lay in tatters. To come back and back into the harbour here and tie up, it was just gut-wrenching. To see my crew dejected for all the hard work they've done, oh, it's very hard to put into words. 
unfinished business is, is a great way to sum up this year's race. Um, the crew, the boat, the owner, it means a lot to us. This is the third year that we're doing it on She's the Culprit. She's ready to go, she's in the best condition and we're just looking forward to get to Hobart. As Wild Oats leads the fleet down the New South Wales coast, the wind begins to shift round to the southeast, and the ominous conditions associated with this race slowly begin to materialise. As the yachts make their way into a strengthening headwind, the crews prepare for what promises to be a rough night on the rail. And for Luda Ingvald's Yuzu team, the race takes a dramatic turn. Thirty-five miles behind the leader, and in a strong 21st place, the sailors with disabilities crew on whatever are pushing their 52-footer into the coming front. While for the crew of She's the Culprit, they have achieved their first goal of just getting out of Sydney in one piece, and like the rest of the fleet, prepare for a night that will test them to their limit. Wild Oats 11, in red, have led the race from the starting gun, but under constant pressure from Investec Loyal in white. Overnight, the wind builds to a 30 knot southwesterly, and by the morning, Wild Oats have stretched their lead from two miles to over 15. The Battle of the Big Maxi Yachts the 100-foot superstars of the race has been joined, and the upwind grind south is well underway. But with over 400 miles to Hobart and just 20 miles separating the top four, there is plenty to fight for. Forty years ago, and one man is about to make sailing history. The cannon has gone, day 312, about 25 past three on April the 22nd, and Robin Knox Johnson and Sue Haley have sailed non-stop around the world. I felt there was the one big thing left in sailing, to go around the world non-stop. And I thought timing was right, I was 29, been at sea all my life. In life, you can say, no, well, there's other important things, or you can say, I'm gonna go and try it. And I didn't want to be 90 looking into the shaving mirror and saying, I could have done that, but I didn't. Five, now 71 years old, Sir Robin has spent his life at sea. But after more than 50 years on the ocean, there still remains one piece of unfinished business. Why am I doing this race? Because I haven't done it before. The Relic Sydney Hobart is one of the world's great classic races. You know, when you've got a race that's got that reputation, you inevitably want to have a go at it. Sir Robin is helming on board Richard Dobbs' 68-foot yacht, Titania of Cows. The crew is a mixture of America's Cup sailors, Olympic medalists, round-the-world veterans and keen amateurs, but all with one thing in common, a love and respect for the ocean. If you go to sea thinking you're capable of conquering the ocean, forget it. The ocean doesn't notice you. The moment your weight disappears, it's forgotten about you. You never conquer the sea. It suffers us. And we better make darn sure we're ready for whatever it can throw at us, or one day we won't come back. Day two of the Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race, and with one boat retiring overnight, Britain's Titania of Cows is lying in 23rd place among the 86 remaining yachts. Like any, any boat, you take a minute or two just to get the feel of the boat and the way the waves are affecting it, and then it's real fun. It's just a buzz because the whole boat feels great and you're surging along. That is fantastic sailing. But on 
board whatever, the mood among the sailors with disabilities crew is very different. Despite an impressive start, their dream of a fast ride to Hobart is over. A sad day for the uh, whatever crew heading home after a, a diesel tank split and had diesel all through the bottom of the boat. Not real safe, just about to enter into that straight. So we're heading home, uh, going okay, but uh, not too much not to go further due to safety. And within minutes of whatever's retirement, the race claims another victim, Luda Ingvall's Yuzu. It's a lot of small things, and uh, nobody's been hurt. People are a little bit sick. Um, with the hydraulic fluid all over the inside, so it's like a skating rink. At the front, Wild Oats prepare to enter the infamous Bass Strait, maintaining their advantage over Investec Loyal. As the wind strengthens and the waves build, the fleet shorten sail and brace themselves for the challenge of the Bass Strait. The maxi yachts at the front of the fleet push hard to escape the brutal headwinds and force their way into the next weather system. But for those behind, the full power of nature is unleashed. It is in the teeth of a 45 knot gale and mountainous seas that the reputation of the Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race is forged. And for those battling their way south, the Bass Strait is an unforgiving place to be. Lying 12 miles north of Tasmania and on the fleet's route south to Hobart is Flinders Island. It is a wind-swept and isolated place, largely divided into farmland and national park, and also known as the last tragic refuge of Tasmania's Aboriginal community, who were exiled here in the 19th century. Its population of under 900 are a hardy breed for whom the sea is a fundamental part of life. Forebearers were here in the early 1800s and they plied the islands with little work boats and traded mutton birds and, and they've been sailing these waters for, for that long and I suppose it's in the blood. Every time you go to sea and there's no guarantee you're going to come home and if I lost a close friend and two of his crew one time, and, uh, of course you've got to have the respect for the sea and, but it's just the way of life. The island and the race are closely linked, and many boats have stopped here for repair, respite, and even recreation. Once the race is over and the New Year celebrations in Hobart are finished, we probably see more of the yachts on the, on the way home, and a lot of yachts actually do come in because they treat the, the trip home as more of a, a cruise and um, to see a bit of the scenery and enjoy the island on the way. As wild oats lead the charge down the Tasmanian coast, the wind eases and begins to go with and not against the leaders. And as they approach the iconic turning mark of Tasman Island, the finished and a fifth victory are less than 40 miles away. And for Titania of Cows, with still over 250 miles to sail, it's the calm after the storm. Not what you expect from the best street, but this is what was in the brochure. It's just really lovely. Nice wind, we're sailing well. We're now 15th. And really all to play for because um, there isn't a huge gap. There's still a chance for us to uh, pull something out of the bag here. The tough overnight conditions have taken the toll of retirements to 15. And for those who have made it through, like Tasmania's She's the Culprit, the welcome home no longer seems quite so far away. Speeding down the Derwent River into Tasmania's capital of Hobart is Wild Oats 11. Two days and seven hours after leaving Sydney.
Wild Oats make up for the disappointment of last year to claim a fifth Rolex Sydney Hobart title. But the celebrations are tempered by news that a protest has been lodged against them and the champagne has to wait. Arriving at Hobart first tonight is just the most amazing feeling. It was, you have to look at the race results and the retirements, and it was a tough race, just like uh, we were expecting. But the produce is the produce, that's fine. We're very confident we've done everything by the book, and uh, we'll see what happens tonight. Just over three hours later, and it's Investec Loyal who takes second place. And for skipper Sean Langman, so close again to victory. Really, we had on the water the potential to win, so um, so look, I'm elated that we're Shit. here, but I'm also quite frustrated that we're second second on the water this year, so, you know, we're, we've got more in this boat, and we've got more in this team, so we'll be back again and again until we finally crack it. You bloody beauty! Confirmation, Wild Oats did make their compulsory radio test before entering Bass Strait. Protest dismissed. Very happy about that one. Well, thank you. After one more sleepless night, this time on land, it's time to celebrate. Fantastic feeling of relief and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big job and this was a tough Hobart and, uh, you know, the Wild Oats team did a fantastic job and everyone's done a fantastic job and it's a great result for us. The ghost of 2009 has been laid to rest and the target of eight record race wins comes one closer. Give them a round of applause. These people are champions. Five times five hours out of six goes. As Wild Oats celebrate, the rest of the fleet makes its way down the Tasmanian coast and into the home strait of the Derwent River, where the welcome of Hobart awaits them. After three and a half days at sea, Titania of Cows see the lights of Constitution Dock and a top 20 finish. Well, I've always looked upon this race as one of the world's classic races. You know, the ferociousness that you've had in some races, uh, but it wasn't that easy either. And I think if it had been easy, it'd been a bit disappointing. It's been a lot of fun and a great crowd on board the boat. We have a really good time together. But there is no more poignant welcome than the one reserved for the hometown heroes. She's the culprit. This team is ten of my best mates. I mean, you can't get any better than that. It's my home port. It's all worth it. This is the most emotional I've ever been in any sport. Very happy. And so proud of the crew too. For the 69 boats that survived the 628 mile journey from Sydney, to finish is everything. But for one boat, there is the ultimate prize. The Tattersall Trophy for the overall winner of the Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. Thank you very much. We're pretty chuffed to, to have this. The Rolex Sydney to Hobart is always the top of the menu for anyone going to sea and racing yachts. So it's fantastic, and, and what a yacht race to, to be involved in. The sea is never conquered, the oceans never mastered. But for those prepared to test themselves, the pure challenge is their reward. Next time, we are in South America as we look at the designs and the sailors who are making this continent one of sailing's most influential regions in the Rolex spirit of yachting.